you know, we really are in the sweet spot. I mean, this is kind of be the next 10 years is going to be kind of the Bitcoin gold rush. You know, I mean, we're going to have a million dollars of coin in 10 years and mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be meaningful. Uh, but we could have a million dollars of coin a lot sooner than 10 years also if if we hit that tipping point, in my view. You know, I think you just you buy it and you hang on to it and knowing that, you know, given enough time and letting time and adoption do its thing, it will be much higher mm -hmm. in five years and 10 years and 15 years. In a previous interview with Peter McCormick, investment manager and Austrian economist Lawrence Leppard articulated the necessity of living in a deflationary world, emphasizing the need for a currency that aligns with such an environment. Leopard's investment management firm specializes in monetary debasement insurance and he passionately advocates for Bitcoin as the quintessential asset to navigate the challenges of modern finance. In a recent interview with Luke McKick, Leopard delved into his latest Bitcoin predictions, suggesting that the cryptocurrency could potentially reach $10 million per coin due to its sustained surge in demand. He foresees Bitcoin continuing to soar to unprecedented heights over the next decade. Let's now hear directly from Lawrence Leppard as he elaborates on why he believes Bitcoin is poised for remarkable growth and widespread adoption. The adoption could happen even quick, more quickly than we think. I mean, we just don't know. Um, to me, it's it's pretty obvious where we're going. And we live in a very digitally connected world and, and word travels quickly and you know, information travels quickly. Or when everyone comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I can't trust this government. They are never going to stop printing. Mm. Get me out of here. And that's what we all in Austrian terms define as Gresham's law, which says when you know your money is losing value very, very rapidly, you exchange it for money that's not losing value. And it's funny because Americans are very unfamiliar with this and haven't really thought about it. We've had a generally stable currency, you know, since World War II, we won that war and a lot of things. And, you know, we haven't had hyperinflation since, you know, we were founded in 89 when the Continental hyperinflated. And so, so the bottom line is, you know, Americans aren't very tuned into this, but people who live in Argentina or, you know, people from the Eastern Bloc countries or people from Venezuela or Zimbabwe, I mean, other people from other countries actually get it a little more than, than the average American gets it, that, you know, it's possible for your government to be so irresponsible that your currency becomes worthless. I'm not suggesting that will happen, but I am suggesting it's it's one of the possible outcomes. You know, 40 years, everything's going to be denominated in sats because what we've got here is a form of money that's superior to government money. And if you look at history, you know, the best technology always wins. I mean, you know, when as SAFE says, when when gunpowder got invited, invented, you know, people kind of stopped using spears and, and and axes. They started firing bullets, you know, and and so, you know, this is this is a form of money that can't be printed. It's sounder than anything a government can create, um, and there and it's you know it's super easy to transfer and move around, uh, and therefore I think it's destined to become the base layer of money. Um, now, is it today? No, of course not. Bitcoin will become much, much more, you know, ubiquitous and easy to use so that, you know, my mother can use it. I mean, right now, my mother's not going to do, you know, she's not going to store shit on a Trezor and do on-chain transactions. It's just too complicated. Mm -hmm. But but that 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 functionality will be available to everyone for pennies uh, at some time in the future in a very easy way and in, in an idiot proof way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's going to take five years, 10 years to fully roll that out. So. Um, but I but I can just, you know, I can see it clear as day. And I think I think Lynn and, and uh, uh, Michael see it as well. And so, um, you know, my view is if there are a limited supply of these things, 21 million, it's kind of like you want to own them and, you know, avoid the rush by now <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to because they're going to be more expensive in the future. I mean, you know, I, I, I often talk about how much fiat money there is out there. And I talk about you know, I mean, as an example, there are 54 million millionaires in the world. There are 21 million. I mean, every millionaire in the world couldn't even own one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So if you own one Bitcoin and this becomes money, you know, you're kind of almost by definition a billionaire. What I would reference is a, um, a, a book written by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. And what it suggests is that a new innovation comes along and there's a period of time where the innovation is kind of getting ironed out and figured out and less than 10 percent of the population is, is using it. And then when you hit 10%, you kind of hit a tipping point where it's like, oh my goodness, this is real and it's big and it's important and it's a change. And then the, the curve gets very steep in terms of adoption. And it appears, and you know, the, the measures are fuzzy, right? We don't know exactly what percentage of people are using Bitcoin, but 
in my in my estimation, we're kind of rapidly approaching that 10% point. And, um, you know, I mean, there's probably not many people in the developed world who haven't at least heard of Bitcoin. They may not be using it, but they're aware of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's going to grow and uh, I think, you know, accelerate. I, but what you're looking at here is a chart that has countries listed on the left. Um, and then the population that are using, and they define it as crypto, which, you know, I, I don't like the word term crypto, really like Bitcoin, but you have to assume that within crypto, a lot of it's Bitcoin. And then the, the right, so that's the blue bar, you know, the number of people who are familiar with crypto in that particular country. And then the right bar is the share of the adult population in percentage terms. So for example, in India, 299 million people are, have used crypto, and that represents 29% of their population. Um, China is very low. They're at nine ninety nine hundred thirty one million eight percent. You know, basically, I think if you look at this and you kind of average it out, I think one could say we're, we're you know share of adult population in all these countries. It, it's got to be averaging ten percent, right? Mm -hmm. When we get to the ten percent, the acceleration takes place. Well, certainly, not everyone owns crypto. In fact, less than ten percent of the population owns crypto, but. But it's the awareness is, is there. As you can see, you know, Bitcoin, that was, you know, we were below 10 percent in 2020. But I think we're crossing 10 percent now. So that whereas I, you know, and, and in fact, Michael Saylor was speaking in um, Madeira and I was there and I heard him say that, you know, we really are in the sweet spot. I mean, this is kind of be, the next 10 years is going to be kind of the Bitcoin gold rush, mm -hmm. you know, from 2024 to 2034. You know, the entire world is going to come to embrace this thing. And uh, and I think I think he's right. The adoption could happen even quickly, more quickly than we think. I mean, we just don't know. Um, to me, it's it's pretty obvious where we're going. And we live in a very digitally connected world and, and word travels quickly and, you know, information travels quickly. Or when everyone comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I can't trust this government. They are never going to stop printing. Mm. Get me out of here. And that's what we all in Austrian terms define as Gresham's law, which says when you know your money is losing value very, very rapidly, you exchange it for money that's not losing value. And it's funny because Americans are very unfamiliar with this and haven't really thought about it. We've had a generally stable currency, you know, since World War II, we won that war and a lot of things. And, you know, we haven't had hyperinflation since, you know, we were founded in 89 when the continental hyperinflated. And so, so the bottom line is, you know, Americans aren't very tuned into this, but people who live in Argentina or, you know, people from the Eastern Bloc countries or people from Venezuela or Zimbabwe, I mean, other people from other countries actually get it a little more than, than the average American gets it, that, you know, it's possible for your government to be so irresponsible that your currency becomes worthless. I'm not suggesting that will happen, but I am suggesting it's it's one of the possible outcomes. You know, 40 years, everything's going to be denominated in sats because what we've got here is a form of money that's superior to government money. And if you look at history, you know, the best technology always wins. I mean, you know, when as Safe says, when when gunpowder got invited, invented, you know, people kind of stopped using spears and, and and axes. They started firing bullets, you know. And and so, you know, this is this is a form of money that can't be printed. It's sounder than anything a government can create. Um, and there and it's you know it's super easy to transfer and move around. Uh, and therefore, I think it's destined to become the base layer of money. Um, now, is it today? No, of course not.